Hi class and uh, welcome to this video lecture. Um, so I'm trying out a new app um, for doing the writing because I think it'll work better. One of the problems I was having was it was skipping ahead too many pages at one time. Um, but also uh, um, what we're going to cover today is the 4.2 material. So we'll see how uh, that goes. Um, so what we're going to talk about in section 4.2 is a few theorems that are leading us towards a few applications of the derivative and also leading us towards the idea of integrals, which we're going to talk about in chapter 5 um, in more detail. So the first theorem we're looking at here is Rolle's theorem. So suppose y equals f of x is continuous on the closed interval a comma b and differentiable at every point of its interior a comma b. If a and b I mean, if f of a equals f of b, then there's at least one number c in a comma b at which f uh, prime of c equals zero. So in other words, between any two points that have the x values that have the same y value, there has to be a point um, where the derivative equals zero. So the idea here is if I draw a little picture, like if here's a and b, and they have the same um, y value, and these are connected, in order to get from A to B, at some point between them, C, the slope of the um, derivative has to be zero. Okay, so that has to occur. So there has to be um, some critical point between those values. So just to illustrate that, we can look at uh, some examples of this. So like, for example, if I look at the first one here, if I set, uh, if I first find the zeros of the function, so I let y equals zero, and I solve for x, uh, this would be four equals x squared, so plus or minus two equals x. So I've got zeros of the function of plus or minus two. And then if I do the same thing with the derivative, so I find y prime is two x, and then I set that equal to zero, I can see that I get um, zero equals x. So we've got a number line here, like that, uh, and we've got our points, our zeros of the um, regular function, negative two and two, then we can also see that in between these, at zero, uh, we have, a derivative of zero. So just like Rawls theorem predicts, um, between any two places where the function is equal to each other, there should be a place where the derivative is zero. So in this case, both of these have a y value of zero, and in between them is a place where the derivative has a zero. Okay, so let's just go ahead and walk through these other three to continue to give you that idea. So the second one here, if we find the derivative of the function, we've got zero equals um, x squared plus 8x plus 15. We can factor that. So that's x uh, plus 5 times x plus 3. And so that gives us x equals negative 5 and x equals negative 3. And so we would expect there to be a zero of the derivative between negative 5 and negative 3. So if we do that, uh, the derivative is 2x plus 8 set that equal to zero, uh, we get negative two x equals eight, so x equals negative four. And just like we predict, uh, Rolle's theorem predicts, there is a derivative, uh, a, val a zero for the derivative between those two. Okay, uh, and so let's just go ahead and do um, the last two to, uh, together here, quickly. Um, so this will be zero equals now, they already went ahead and factored this out for us just to make our life a little easier. So we've got x plus 1 times x minus 2 squared. So for this one, we get x equals negative 1, or x equals positive 2. And once again, if we find the derivative of this function, which is y, equal, y prime equals 3x squared minus 6x, we can set that equal to 0 and solve. And we get... Um, factor out an x, a 3x, and that gives us 3x uh, times x minus 2. Uh, and in this case, we get, so we get 3x equals 0, so x equals 0, or x equals 2. So notice, in this case, 
between the two values that have the same y, we got a derivative that was zero. And then we can do it one more time. So the last one, same idea. Um, set the function equal to zero. So we've got x times x minus nine times x minus 24. Set each one of those equals zero. And we x equals zero, x equals nine, and x equals 24. And if we look at the derivative of this, the derivative uh, for this one is 3x squared minus 66x plus 216. Set that equal to 0, and we can solve. So first divide everything by 3. So we got x squared minus 22x plus 72. And then I believe we should be able to factor this. Um, so two numbers that multiply to get together to get 72 and add to get negative uh, 22. Let's see, would be eighteen and four, negative eighteen and negative four. So ne x minus eighteen times x minus four. So we get x equals eighteen or x equals four. And so just like all the other examples, in each one of these regions where the y values were the same for these x's, I get an x value. So between 0 and 9, I get 4. And between 9 and 24, I get 18. Okay. Um, and so... Just looking at those examples, I don't think I'm going to go through the proof here, but using Rawls theorem and these examples, we can see that between any two zeros of a polynomial, there lies a zero of the um, derivative. So in other words, between any two zeros of the polynomial, we're going to find a maximum or a minimum value um, or a critical point of... Um, the function, or a maximum or minimum value. So that's Rawls theorem. So then the mean value theorem kind of builds on this. It says, suppose uh, y equals f of x is continuous over a closed interval a comma b and differentiable on the intervals a comma b. Then there is at least one point c in a comma b at which the average rate of change between uh, a and b, right? Because this is that's what this function is. This is the change in y over the change in x is equal to the derivative of c. So it says find the value c for, that satisfy the mean value theorem uh, for the intervals below. So what you want to start out with uh, when you're doing these is you want to start out by finding um, the average rate of change and the derivative of the function. So um, let's go ahead and do that here in a second. So we can start out here by finding the average rate of change uh, between these two points. So that would be delta y over delta x equals the square root of 3 minus 1 minus the square root of 1 minus 1 over 3 minus 1. So that's 2 minus 1 over uh, 2. Ooh, actually, sorry, nope. That is incorrect, so let me fix that. So that should be the square root of 2 minus 0 over 2, or the square root of 2 over 2. So that's step 1. Uh, step 2 is I need to find the derivative. So let's find the derivative of x. So I'm going to have to use the chain rule for that. So the derivative of a square root is 1 over 2 times the square root of x minus 1 times the derivative of x minus 1, which is just 1. So f prime of x is 1 over 2 times the square root of x minus 1. So now that I found both those things, I can figure out what c has to be. So I want to find, I want to let f prime of c equal the square root of 2 over 2. So that would be 1 over 2 times the square root of c minus 1 equals the square root of 2 over 2. So 
Get rid of uh, the fraction on this side, so multiply by the bottom. So 1 equals the square root of 2 over 2 times 2 times the square root of c minus 1. So the, these 2's cancel. So that's 1 equals the square root of 2 times the square root of c minus 1. We can square both sides to get 1 equals 2 times c minus 1. Divide by um, 2 to get 1 half equals c minus 1, and then add 1 to both sides to get c equals 3 halves. So notice that's a number in the region that has the slope at that point equal to the average rate of change. Okay, so that's the idea. So let's go ahead and try. Um, if you want to, at this point, uh, you can pause the video for a moment. Um, and go ahead and give this second problem a try, um, and then we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this one a try. So, um, first we can find the average rate of change. So in this case, that is 1 to the 2 thirds minus 0 to the 2 thirds over 1 minus 0. So that is... 1 minus 0 over 1, so that is 1. Then we need to find the derivative, so f prime of x. Um, multiply by the exponent and subtract 1 from 2 thirds, and you'll get negative 1 third. Okay, and so now we want to let f prime... f prime of c equal 1. So that'll be 2 thirds times c to the negative 1 third equals 1. We can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 2 thirds to get 3 halves equals um, x to the negative 1 third. And then to get rid of that negative 1 third, I raise both sides to the reciprocal of that power. So x equals 3 halves to the negative third. The negative flips it over and then we take them to the third power. So x would equal two to the third power is eight over three to the third power, which is 27. I'm um, sorry. And I did notice one just little tiny um, thing there that we should fix, which is these should be C's instead of X's just to be um, follow the notation uh, that we're using. Okay, so that's the idea. That's what, how you, um, just a couple examples of using the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so on to the next page. So the next page uh, has two corollaries of the intermediate value theorem, which say, corollary, the first one is, if f prime of x equals zero at each point x on an open interval, then f of x equals c for all x in a comma b where c is constant. So one of the things we should remember is that the derivative of a constant is zero. So if the derivative of a function is zero, then that function must have been a constant. We don't know which constant, but we know it must have been a constant. Another corollary is that if two functions have the same derivative at each point x in an open interval, then there exists a constant c such that f of x equals g of x plus c for all x in a comma b. That is, f minus g is a constant function in a comma b. So the idea here is that um, because of the way derivatives work, when you take a derivative, you lose the constant uh, because the derivative of constant is zero. So if we work backwards, we can use what we know about derivatives to take a derivative and work backwards to the original function, but we're going to have to add a constant in at the end to make sure we get all of them. So like, for example, here, um, if we're looking at this fu original function, if we look just at the 3x squared part, we know that mm -hmm. x squared must have come from a derivative of x cubed, the derivative of that must have for x squared to be a derivative, it must have come from an x cubed. Okay, right? Because the derivative of a polynomial is n times x to the n minus 1. So working backwards to that, we know that that must have come from um, an x cubed and um, that 
Um, so the original, I mean, the original function would be x to the n times 1 over n. Right, so if this is the derivative, these two would go together. Um, whatever the original function was. So like, for example, here, um, 3x squared must be 3 times 1 third x to the third. Okay, because that's where that derivative must come from, right? Because, And so if we simplify that, those multiply and we get x cubed for that first term. And that makes sense, right? Because the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So the second term, 2x, must be 2 times 1 half x squared. And once again, if we simplify, that's x squared. And if we check x squared, the derivative of that is 2x. And then the last one would be um, minus um, 1 times 1 over x to times x. I mean, 1 over 1, sorry, 1 over 1 times x, right? Because right now it's a constant function. And whenever we have the constant function as a derivative, that came from the constant function times x. So that one would simply be minus x, and that derivative is negative 1. So we know all the any function that has the given derivative must look like this, but it could have had a constant term on it. So we want to add a plus c at the end. Okay? So everybody... Um, so that's the idea there. So uh, polynomials, that's the idea, is that's how you would take the derivative. Now, if we have a function in the denominator, we want to remember how that derivative worked. And the way that derivative worked, remember, was it was the opposite of n times um, 1 over x to the n plus 1. Right? So whatever we started with, must have had a derivative that was one less than that, so that would be 1 over x to the n. And we would have needed to multiply by its reciprocal, so by the opposite of 1 over n. So when we're doing this second one here, the first one's pretty straightforward because it's just a constant, and as all we saw, that must have come from 5x, right? Because the derivative of 5x is 5. And so for the next one, what we'd do is we'd take plus... The n here, if I added 1 to get to here, it has to be 1 less than that. So the n would be 1. So this would be negative 1 over 1 times 1 over x to the first. Right? Because it had to be 1 less. So that would be y equals 5x minus 1 over x plus c. And once again, we can check our answer by taking the derivative. So the derivative of 5x is 5. The derivative of negative 1 over x is... Um, We multiply by negative 1 to make it positive, and we add 1 to the exponent to get a 2. So that checks. This does have the derivative of the original. Okay, now for the next one, we have to deal with square roots. So what we want to remember is that um, the derivative of a square root, if we get the derivative of something like uh, 1 over the square root of x, that must have come from... Um, well, we want to remember that 1 over 2 square root of x is equal to the square root of x. Those derivatives um, came from the derivative of the square root of x. So if we want to deal with a square root in a um, portion here, we have to remember this um, that there should have been a 2. So another way to think about this is this square root um, is 2 over 2. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I don't really like that one because it doesn't take into account the n. So, um, let's rewrite this. So, the square root of an x in the denominator uh, would have been the square root of x uh, would have been 2 square root of x. So, a square root would have been 2 square root of x um, because we would have needed this 2 to cancel out. Right, and you can check that uh, if you try to do that derivative. Uh, that's two over two root x, and the twos cancel, so you get one over the square root of x. So when we're going backwards from a square root and a denominator, we're going to need a two uh, in the numerator, so those cancel. 
So let's go ahead and try this one down here. So we start with the one that's a um, polynomial term. So we can use this first rule at the top here. So this would be four times one. We need to add one to the exponent. So that's going to become us x squared. And then this is one over n minus, uh, like we said, this one over the square root of x is two root x. And then we get our plus c. And then we can simplify. So y equals 2x squared minus 2 root x plus c. And if you think about, uh, if you do the derivative of that, it checks back to the original. And then this last one here is a trig one. So you just have to think in the reverse of the trig functions. So what trig function gives us, um, well, and also we have to undo the chain rule. So this one's a little trickier here. Um, so what you one way another way to think about this is you can think about well what's missing when you do this so the first thing to ask yourself is well what trig function goes with um i mean doing some guess and check so the trig function that goes with sine it, it's derivative that has the derivative of sine is cosine so that would be cosine of 2t okay so if we did that derivative right now Okay, so we could try that derivative and see if we're right. So right now, that derivative would be what? It would we do the negative sign of 2t, and then we'd have to do times the derivative of the inside, which is a 2. So that would be negative 2 sine of 2t. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a negative or a 2 in the derivative we started with. So we need to think about, well, how could, what number would get rid of that? Well, if we multiply that by negative 1 half, it would get rid of that. So let's do y equals negative 1 half cosine of 2t. And if we check that derivative, um, plus, let me go ahead and put the plus c, sorry, I forgot that part. It's a very common mistake that I do a lot, so I'm going to try to fix it, forgetting to add the constant. If we do that derivative, well, we do, so this would be negative 1 half times the derivative of cosine. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine 2t times the derivative of 2t. Okay, and if we multiply, if the derivative of 2t is 2, so 2 times 1 half cancels, negative, negative cancels, and we're just left with sine of 2t. So you can also do some guessing and checking like that. Start by just undoing the basic function and seeing what, um, and doing its derivative and seeing what you're missing, and then you need to multiply by any reciprocals to get rid of them. So why don't you all, Go ahead and pause the video for a moment and try doing these uh, four functions, uh, and then we'll talk about them together here in a second. Okay. So, hopefully you've given those a try, uh, but let's go ahead and work through them. So, this first one is simply a polynomial, so those are fairly straightforward. So, you simply undo the minus one, so you add one to the exponent. So that's an x to the fourth. And then you have to multiply it by 1 over that. So 1 over 4. And then we add in the constant. And if you check your answer here, right, the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x to the third. So this would be 1 fourth times 4x to the third. Those cancel, just leaving you with x to the third, which is exactly what we expected. Okay, so same idea here, right? Add 1 to the exponent. So that's x squared, and then multiply by 1 over that new exponent. Okay, yep. And then for a constant, we just multiply it by x. So our y here should be x squared minus x plus c. And if you check that derivative, right, the derivative of x squared is 2x, the derivative of the opposite of x is negative 1, and the derivative of a constant goes away. So that is our answer. Okay? The next one, we're dealing with a denominator, uh, but it's the same kind of idea, right? So this is y prime equals negative. We're going to add 1 to the exponent, and then we're going to multiply by the opposite of 1 over that exponent. Okay, and so that would equal 
So our y, sorry, not y prime, our y is 1 over 3x cubed plus c. And once again, if we want to check that, we can find that derivative. So to do that derivative, um, we multiply by the opposite of the exponent. So that would be negative 3 times 1 over 3x. And we... Sorry, nope, we didn't do that. I didn't do that run right. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. Sorry about that. So let's try this one more time. So if I go back uh, to the beginning here, I did I did do one thing wrong. So this neg is right. Um, I do want to do, but I want to do 1 over x, right? So I to do the derivative, I add 1 to the exponent. So to undo the derivative, I subtract 1. So I subtract 1 there. And I'm going to multiply by the opposite of the 1 over the new exponent. And so that'll give me a y of 1 over x plus c. And if I check that derivative, to do that derivative, we multiply by the opposite of the exponent. So negative 1 times 1 over, add 1 to the exponent. Derivative of constant is 0. And if we simplify that, that's negative 1 over x squared, which is where we start. So that one is correct. Okay, and so for the last one here, uh, we can do this um, kind of get with guess and check, right? So the derivative of cosine is sine. So this will be sine of t over 2. And so if I try to take that plus c, if I try to take that derivative, I get y prime is cosine of t over 2. But I still need to do the derivative of the inside of t over 2. So that's actually one-half cosine of t over 2. So I need to get rid of that one-half, so I multiply the uh, original by the reciprocal. So this will be y equals 2 sine of t over 2 plus c. And if you take that derivative, uh, the one-half will cancel with the 2, and that will give you the answer um, they were looking for. So that's the idea of how to... Um, work use this intermediate value theorem and its corollaries to work backwards and in fact this is exactly the kind of stuff we're going to do with integrals uh, later on in chapter five so one of the applications of this is actually being able to work backwards from knowing the acceleration of something to find more specific values using what is called um, initial values so one of the things we know is that the accelerate, um, so a reminder of some of the stuff we know, I'll put up here at the top of the page, maybe, if I can figure out how to do that. Um, hold on one second. Okay, yep. So if I do that, um, nope, because I want to use the pen. So never mind. Okay, I'll write them over here. Um, is that the acceleration equals the derivative of the velocity and the velocity equals the derivative of the position function. So we can work backwards from the acceleration to figure out an equation for um, position with respect to time. So if I know that the acceleration is 9.8, that means V, which it would have to be the uh, reverse of that. So if the derivative is 9.8, uh, the accelerate, if the derivative is 9.8, then the original function would be, it's a constant, so that's 9.8t plus a constant value. And now, what we can do is we can figure out what that constant value is by using an initial value. That's what this is. So we know that at time 0, the velocity is negative 3. So if we plug those into the function here, so the velocity is negative 3 at time 0, so t is 0, and we solve that, we see that c is negative 3. So the velocity function is 9.8t minus 3. Now once we've done that, we can see that the velocity is the derivative of the position function, so we can work backwards again. So using the information we just did, the if the derivative is 9.8t minus 3, then the original function would be 9.8 times t squared, and remember I have to multiply by 1 over 2, minus 3t plus c. Multiply those together and we get s equals um, 4.9t squared 
minus 3t plus c. And once again, I can use an initial value to figure out what the constant is. So at, at time 0, our position was 0. So 0 equals 4.9 times 0 squared minus 3 times 0 plus c. So 0 equals c. So s equals 4.9t squared minus 3t is the equation for the position um, function. Okay, and so that's all there really is to that. So we're just using this idea that we just talked about to work backwards. So the next one, same idea. If I know the acceleration, I can find the velocity um, by using the corollary of the intermediate value theorem. So for this one, uh, we know that the derivative, the function that gives us a derivative of cosine is sine. So we can just call this 9 over pi squared sine of 3t over pi. And then we can check that derivative to see if we're doing it right. So the derivative of that would be 9 pi squared cosine of 3t pi times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of 3t pi is 3 pi. So if you notice, what is in up happening here is by doing the derivative cosine, we've actually um, got a 3t, a 3 pi coming out of there, which means this 9 pi squared is um, actually too big. What I really just need to get this 9 pi squared is a 3 pi, right? Because right now this is multiplying to get uh, 27 over pi cubed cosine of 3t pi. But if instead I only put a 3 pi out front, I would get the answer I want, which is the 9 pi squared. So velocity equals 3 pi sine of 3t pi plus c. And we can see from our initial value that if I plug in 0 for t, I would get 0 here. Um, so that would cancel. So C is just going to end up being whatever the velocity is, which in this case is 0. So our function is V equals 3 pi sine of 3t pi is our velocity function. And then once again, to find the position function, we can just work back again. The um, function that is the uh, that gives us a derivative of sine is cosine. So S so the original function must have been s equals um, cosine of 3t pi plus c. And if we take the derivative of that, we get negative sine of 3t pi times the derivative of the inside, which is 3 over pi. And so we notice that all that we're missing is a negative, right? Because we want this to be positive 3. So our s is negative cosine of 3t over pi plus c. And then we can plug in our values and simplify. So this will be negative 1 equals negative cosine of 3 times 0 over pi plus c. Uh, the cosine of 0 is 1. So this is negative 1 equals negative 1 plus c. Add 1 to both sides and you get 0 equals C. So our S is negative cosine of 3T over pi. Okay, so that's the idea. So there's one page left in this section, which is two more of these examples. So I'd like you all to take a few minutes, try those. Notice that here, before you try these, that... Um, I'm giving you the velocity. So all you have to do is this part, that the velocity equals the derivative of s. So pause the video for a moment and try these two. Uh, then we'll go through the answers, and then we will be done with the video lecture for 4.2. Okay, so now that you've tried these problems, uh, let's go ahead and run through them. So like we said before, um, v is equal to the derivative of s. So if we know v, the original function, we can work backwards. So this will be 32 times t one half t squared minus 2t plus c. 
That's S equals 16 T squared minus 2T plus C. And we can plug in the initial value to solve for our constant. So 4 equals 16 times 1 half squared minus 2 times 1 half plus C. So 4 equals um, 4 minus 1 plus C. So 4 equals 3 plus C. So C equals 1. So our function is S equals 16T squared minus 2T plus 1. Okay, so that's the idea there. And then we can go and do the last one. So the function that gives us cosine is sine. So S is going to be sine of 2T over pi or something like that. So we can um, plus C. So we can check that derivative. The derivative of that is cosine of 2t pi times 2 pi, right? Derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of 2t pi is 2 over pi. And that's exactly what we expect. So that is my function. And so now I can plug in my initial value. So 1 equals sine of 2 pi squared over pi plus c. So 1 equals sine of 2 pi plus c. Sine of 2 pi is 0, so 1 equals c. So s equals sine of 2t over pi plus 1. Okay, so that's it for today's video lecture. Uh, just make sure that you are doing the homework and keeping up with the material, and I will um, continue to do these video lectures, so watch.